and we'll now take a few minutes for a Q&A with the audience. Uh, yeah, I see that there are already questions, so <laughs> yes, please, sir. Good. I, uh, this uh, actually uh, would be for Professor Moore and uh, Director Ose. Uh, so uh, first, I want to sort of recognize a, a very lucid and polished uh, presentations uh, from both of you. So that's uh, appreciated uh, and recognized. Uh, uh, one question for uh, Professor Moore, and then maybe for both of you. Well, the one for uh, Professor Moore. Uh, first, I, I think I heard that you clerked for Justice Alito. Is that right? Now, I understand there's you know a vow of secrecy in the confessional there. Uh, it, 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 he's uh, in some quarters a national hero at the moment. Uh, and I understand you can't speak anything to that. But if there's anything you can tell us about clerking for uh, uh, Justice Alito, that would be welcome and for, for both of you. Uh, if I've got it right, if I remember correctly, the uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Committee at the UN is a repository of all the bad boys on the planet. Uh, they have North Korea and China, something like that. Uh, uh, so uh, how, how do you, uh, I don't know, negotiate or work human rights uh, in that uh, milieu? Uh, thank you. Um, so first off, sometimes um, we confuse Human Rights Committee and Human Rights Council. And so Human Rights Council has been a repository, uh, I mean, you know, led by countries like Libya, et cetera. And um, that continues. There was an effort to uh, reform um, that the Trump administration withdrew, right? There have been efforts at reform. The Biden administration has now uh, rejoined, um, uh, I think partly as a result of those reforms uh, and also with this notion that better to work for reform from, from the inside. But you're right, um, the Human Rights Council is um, sort of notorious for having some of the worst human rights uh, offenders on um, and for uh, focusing, say, on Israel far more than China. Um, so there's, there are a lot of issues uh, and problems with that, that council. Uh, maybe I'll let Rebecca respond also, and then I can talk about Justice Alito. Uh, well, I think you pretty much covered that. Okay. Yeah, the committee was not... So one of the questions, I, uh, sort of as a follow-up, do you did you see um, or looking at the recommendations? Who's issuing them? It does look like it, it is. Western cut. I mean, I guess it's a whole mix, right? But do you, what role do you see of some of the right poor actors in human rights in on these issues? Well, see, this is one of the difficulties um, that a lot of the countries that we would not generally think of as being leaders on human rights are are very bad on certain social issues, and those who are actually willing to give voice to those issues in you know both in in the UPR but also in the General Assembly are ones that are not always seen as the best actors on these issues. So you sometimes have splits where it's, you can work with certain countries on issues of religious freedom, for example, but they would not be the best people to work with on issues of life. And, and th these are some of the, <laughs> the difficulties of, of working in these spaces. Is there another question? I saw, what, you want question? Uh, why don't we, uh, I, I, there was another question and I can talk to you if we don't have time. Yeah, drink, drink a coffee break. <laughs> I'm well. happy to talk about Justice we're, Alito. We're running, I love Justice Alito. We'll, we'll <laughs> see if we have some time later. We're running a little bit late, so we, we'll just go to the next questions, and then we'll have time to oh, discuss that during the coffee break, too. <laughs> okay. I was just wondering, um, what of the countries that are promoting these new rights in international venues, um, do they by any chance have these specific new rights in their own country's constitutions? Um, so that's a great question, and I didn't have time to get into a lot of the more granular data. Um, so I break out these recommendations on various categories. Um, so, you know, for example, on SOGI, I have, you know, decriminalization, protection, promotion, and um, uh, acceptance or recognition, that's recognition. And what you'll see is that some of the countries that are very happy to promote decriminalization um, 
will then note recommendations coming in about something that's a little further down the line, so more of the recognition type of thing. And so we see that even you know in regions that are more um, willing to pressure other countries on SOGI, there is a line they aren't ready to cross and they're getting pressure on that. So I guess it really, <laughs> I mean, yes, countries can have taken on so much, but not, they haven't yet gone all the way. But I think the, the, the general idea is that once you've agreed to part of it, then you will get pressured on the next part and so on and so forth. So I hope that answers your question. We had another question, another question over there. Sir? Uh, thank you. I had sort of a comment for Rebecca and a, and a question for David. Rebecca, I thought that was just genuinely illuminating. One of the things it underscores is we need to complicate our categories a little bit and have more categories than just persuasion on the one hand or coercion on the other hand. There's all sorts of intermediate types of political action. There's dangling funds. There's badgering and reputational pressure, and all these things kind of hover in between persuasion and coercion, and these are actually the main mechanisms by which this kind of neo-colonial promotion of uh, abortion and uh, gender identity and so on occurs. Um, so that was, a, I guess, a general comment for the group that we need to be a little more nuanced than persuasion and coercion. Um, the a question for uh, David was something like this. I, I thought you had maybe two different theses going on in the presentation. One thesis was that the positive law is indeterminate. But as the presentation went on, it seemed to morph um, into a somewhat different thesis, which is the positive law is completely determinate. It's just that these bodies aren't following it. So um, when it came to the inherent right to life, your view seemed to be that the positivist tools could tell us that it, whatever it means, it certainly doesn't mean the sort of interpretations that have been offered, but the problem is we have no institutional mechanism for forcing these bodies to follow the determinate positive law. So I was curious first, which of those theses is nearer and dearer to your heart? Um, and secondly, I just want to record my view that I think I like the indeterminacy thesis better. That is, I think if you ask some of these people, I think they are in the grip of appallingly bad theories of human rights, but they are sincere in the sense that they take themselves to be following the law. It's just that they think, for example, that unless abortion is universally available, then it's, it's not real, it's not really a life, it's a kind of political death, it's not a life worth living. I think they are sincerely trying to interpret these things, but the problem is their, their theories are horrible. Um, so in my view, the indeterminacy thesis is sort of better, um, but I just throw that out there. Yeah, so, um, after serving my brief term on the Human Rights Committee, I wrote a paper on um, the fact that the committee does not follow the international law of human rights using these examples. And then the natural law part of this came as a result of this conference invitation that there are implications for natural law theory, or at least the contestation between natural law and positivism of this. So you're right, there's, there's sort of uh, two tracks here. The one uh, is sort of what I um, am publishing right now. The other was um, inspired by this conference. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when I, um, again, it was a very brief time, but serving on the committee, uh, there were not, that was not bad faith. Um, you know, these uh, people were, I think, acting very much in good faith. They were concerned about human rights. They were trying to promote human rights. Um, and there's a critical role for it. I mean, you see all these individual communications from countries like Russia or Belarus, right, just sort of consistent fundamental human rights violations that go unaddressed and the country seems to have no interest, um, you know, won't even respond to the committee in, in some situations. And so I think there's an important role to say, even if you're not willing to acknowledge this, there is a body that will tell you 
this is wrong, right? You can't um, prevent people from gathering uh, to, to protest or from sharing their religious views somewhere other than the registered address of their religion in the country, right? Um, uh, so I think there was a lot of sincerity and good faith, but I don't think there is... Um, you know, at the Supreme Court, we think a lot about the ju jurisprudential philosophies of each individual justice. You don't have that same sort of thing uh, on the committees, uh, partly because uh, members of the committees are more or less engaged. Their terms are, are not for life, right? So you have some members who are very engaged and who know the history of the jurisprudence or the, the you know, the... Uh, all the prior decisions that have been made and, and will step in and say, hey, in a previous case, we decided this or, or that or the other. But not everyone on the committee is going to know um, that that exists uh, and, and are not necessarily going to think of it in terms of a consistent theory of I I interpretation. And so, again, I see good faith, but I think you're absolutely right. There is not a consistency um, I mean, this is different than the Supreme Court in that we do have a law of interpretation. So, you know, we lack that in the Constitution. And so it's a little bit more maybe concerning uh, that there isn't more commit uh, awareness slash, I mean, I think there's awareness. There isn't more commitment maybe to application of uh, that law of interpretation in the process. I think some of it is time. You know, there are over a thousand individual communications in backlog, you know, take six, nine years, I can't remember the exact figure, right, just to respond to the backlog, uh, and of course those keep coming in, and so um, there's not the sort of time for these committee members who hold other jobs, don't get paid, meet three times a year, um, to sit down maybe and think really carefully about um, how to interpret and applying the law of treaty interpretation. So um, I think that may be some of, of what's happening, but the result is good faith, not consistent uh, approach. Is there any more question? Yes. And Professor Brammer, I do want to talk about Justice Alito, so, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll let us continue with this theme. This question is for Justice Botego. Possible? Can we? Yeah. No problem. So thank you very much for walking us through that, that really agonizing case. Uh, it's shocking how long it took, um, the case itself. And when you consider the implications for the adoptive family and the child himself. And it's, I think, for, for those of us who don't follow this all the time, I think one of the questions I ask is, um, who was clearly the, the driver behind this case going on and on and on because the Somalian mother, no way would she have had the power or the understanding to run such a case. And I ask, is there any outcry or protest to protect families from such a case happening again? Brevemente, en una opinión disidente que tuve que formular en un asunto chipriota. En la disidente opinión que escribí en un asunto contra Cyprus. Me quejé que la sentencia de Estrasburgo, de Estrasburgo parecía a veces, a veces en ocasiones hechas desde una torre de marfil. I complained that Strasbourg court judgments seemed uh, to be made from an ivory tower. En el asunto Tisiak contra Polonia, no se puede decir que una niña ha nacido violando el convenio europeo. No se puede decir. In Tisiak v. Poland, for instance, they held that a girl's birth was a violation of the European Convention. En este asunto, esta joven somalí estaba dirigida y asistida por una abogada noruega de apellido Lotina, no me parece muy noruego, pero no sé quiénes estaban detrás. This Somali mother was being assisted by a Norwegian attorney whose name, last name was Lotina, 
which did not seem very Norwegian, but I don't know who else was behind it, behind <laughs> her. Para mí es un ejemplo de la preocupación por ser políticamente correcto y no herir a nadie. To me, the judgment was an example of being uh, trying to be the court trying to be politically correct and not trying to hurt um, someone's feelings. ¿Usted cree que es normal, lógico, racional pensar que en Noruega se puede aplicar el Corán? Do you think it's normal or logical to um, think that in, Nor in Norway um, the Quran can be applied legally? En, oficialmente, no en la vida privada, evidentemente. Officially, not in private life. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. We, it looks like we have one more question. Wait a minute. Cardinal MBC Minens has a question. Dear Professor, may I ask to you, you know, the boy was of course a minor, but he himself, what did he prefer? Did he prefer to go to his mother or remain in the Norwegian family? The boy himself was of course a minor, but what did he prefer? To remain in the Norwegian family or to return to his mother? El niño con cuatro meses fue a una asistente en Noruega. Después fue a una familia de acogida con un año. The child at four months went to um, Norwegian family services and then to a foster family at uh, one year of age. Y estuvo tres años con la familia de, de acogida y después de cuatro fue en adopción. He spent three, year, three years in foster care and on the fourth year he was adopted. El niño tenía problemas si la madre aparecía. Problemas de sueño y de lloro. La madre, en su, su naturaleza, era conflictiva. The mother was, um, did not have a good relationship with the child when she visited. The child couldn't sleep, um, and his personality changed. So there, there were issues there. Hubo varios procesos en los que intervinieron muchos testigos muchos expertos y todos estimaron que el niño estaba mejor con la familia de acogida. There were legal processes that involved many witnesses and expert witnesses and they all agreed that the child was better off with the adoptive family and not with the birth mother. Yo estoy de acuerdo. El niño, si su madre es musulmana, no hay padre debía seguir siendo musulmán, pero la madre apareció en Noruega. Fue imposible encontrar una familia musulmana. I agree that if the mother's wishes were that the child be Muslim, then the child should be with a Muslim family, but they made all efforts possible to find a Muslim adoptive family and they could not find one. Más, las autoridades noruegas encontraron una familia posible de acogida musulmana, pero era de Afganistán. Y el musulmán de Afganistán, comparado con el musulmán de Somalia, de Somalia absolutamente diferente y la madre no lo quería. They found a Muslim family that came from Afghanistan, but uh, it was not the same branch of Islam that the mother uh, practiced, so she did not agree with the choice. No sé qué más se puede hacer. No, para mí, Noruega lo hizo muy bien. Yo no estoy ni de acuerdo con la violación de la vida privada, pero la sentencia de la gran sala me inquieta. Norway did everything right in that case. Um, I agree with 
Um, I don't agree with the holding because they didn't do anything wrong, and I think the ruling is a concern. My opinion. <laughs> My opinion. Yes. Do we, oh, there is a question over there. <laughs> yeah, this is our last question, and then we'll. We can continue this conversation during the coffee break. For Juez Borrego, for the judge, uh, uh, former judge uh, Borrego Borrego, uh, about this case, you, we read about the case in Argentina, and uh, it was related um, with, uh, as, as we saw it, it was uh, related. No, no, okay. English. Okay, okay, okay. English. Okay, okay. okay. and then. Uh, the issue is we thought it was about the continuity uh, when we read it without knowing much about the case that it was about the continuity and um, in the costumes and the religious uh, and um, environment of the child by adoptive parents. However, uh, when you presented the case, I was worried about another reasoning that was maybe underlying this case, and this was the issue of contractualization affiliation that we see has to do with uh, reproductive, reproductive techniques, surrogate motherhood, and now, of course, also in adoption. And we know that this has been uh, condemned by the court in the case of Paradiso Campanelli, but then uh, we see that there is a, an approach to contractualization and adoption in many countries, uh, one of them, of course, Argentina. And if the mother has a saying, if the mother has to consent to adoption, there is a, a vicinity to the figure of contract in adoption that maybe, I don't know, I wanted to ask uh, to see your view, maybe is underlying the push that this case had to be pulled through and, and, and come to the Grand uh, Chamber. I don't know. I was just wondering if this was the case. La madre no estaba capacitada para ser madre. Punto número uno. The mother was an unfit mother to begin with. Punto número dos. La madre viene con 16 años, entra en Noruega, 17, con un bebé de dos meses. The mother was a teenage mother, 16 years old. She came to Norway with a two-month-old baby. Los servicios sociales atienden a la madre como refugiada y al bebé. She acquired refugee status and um, social services were given to her and the baby. Buscan una familia de acogida musulmana en línea con la el carácter de Somalia. They did look for a Muslim family that aligned with um, her Muslim beliefs um, that she had that she held in Somalia. La madre no busca relación con el hijo dos veces al año, dos horas cada vez. The mother did not seek a relationship with the child. She only visited twice a year for about two hours each time. Quiere imponer que el niño sea circuncidado que vaya a una escuela coránica y que sea además alimentado con las tradiciones musulmanas. She demanded that the child be um, um, schooled in a Quranic school, that he not be fed pork, and that the child be circumcised. Y todo ello en Noruega, pagada por los servicios sociales de Noruega, etc. And all she wanted um, for everything to be paid by Norwegian social services. In my opinion, excessive. Mm. I just think it was an excessive judgment. All right. I think okay. we're, we're done for, for, the, for this session. So we'll now have a, a, a quick coffee break.